may have been victims of incest or rape. We may have had terrible childhoods of deprivation and neglect. Experiences like these may have led us to inflict the same abuse on others. We may have prostituted ourselves or allowed other forms of degradation because we didn't feel that we deserved anything better. Though painful and sad, the past cannot be changed. However, the warped beliefs we have developed about ourselves and others can be changed with the help of our higher power. We write about events like these so that we can be free of our most painful secrets and get on with our lives. We don't have to be the lifelong victims of our past. To experience serenity, we must begin to alter the self-defeating patterns that have prevailed in our lives. The fourth step helps us identify those patterns. We begin to see how we have maneuvered through life, perhaps not consciously planning our own misery but making choices which resulted in our lives becoming unmanageable. Most of us have blamed various people for the prices we paid for our addiction. We didn't want to accept that our addiction had a negative impact that we alone were responsible for. Some of us committed crimes and then complained about the consequences. Some of us were irresponsible at work and then objected loudly when we were held accountable. We beat a hasty retreat whenever life caught up with us. Our inventories will help us identify our responsibility for our actions and find those circumstances where we tend to place blame elsewhere. Our booklet, Working Step 4 in Narcotics Anonymous, can provide more avenues to explore. The quality of our lives depends, to a large degree, on the results of our decisions. As we write our inventory we look for the times when we made decisions that hurt us. We also look for those times when we made decisions that worked out well. If we lived our lives by default, refusing to make any choices, we write about that, too. Those times when we procrastinated until opportunities were missed and gone, the times when we abandoned all responsibility, the times when we withdrew and refused to participate in life all our inventory material. Most of us had hopes and dreams for ourselves at some point in our lives, but we abandoned those in the pursuit of our addiction. In our inventory we try to recall our lost dreams and find out how our choices had ruined our chances of having those dreams come true. We ask ourselves when we stop. 22. Believing in ourselves and when we stop believing in anything outside ourselves. Through this process, our lost dreams may reawaken. We dig deep to learn how we live in conflict with our own morals and values. If we believed it was wrong to steal and we were stealing everything we could get our hands on anyway, what did we do to quiet our anguish? If we believed in monogamy but were unfaithful to our partners, what did we do so that we could live with our compromised principles? Certainly we used more drugs, but what else? We explore how we felt about ignoring our deepest beliefs. In the process, we discover our lost values so that we can begin to rebuild them. In our inventory, we will need to be aware of our assets. With most of us being unaccustomed to looking for our character strengths, we might have some trouble with this task. But if we examine our behavior with an open mind, we're sure to find situations where we persevered in the face of adversity, show concern for others, or even where our spirit triumphed over our addiction. We begin to uncover the pure and loving spirit that lies at the core of our being as we look for our character assets.
We begin to define our values. We learn what we can do and, more importantly, what we can do if we want to lead productive and fulfilling lives. What we did in our active addiction will not work for us in recovery step 4 allows us to chart a new course for our lives. The fourth step provides us with the initial insight we need to grow. Whether we are writing our first inventory or our 20th, we are starting a process that takes us from confusion to clarity, from resentment to forgiveness, from spiritual confinement to spiritual freedom. We can turn to this process again and again. When we are confused, when we are angry when we have problems that don't seem to disappear, an inventory is a good way to take stock of just where we stand on the path to recovery. After we have written a number of inventories, we may discover that our first fourth step merely scratched the surface. As different attitudes and behaviors become apparent to us in later recovery we will want to renew the process of change by working the fourth step again. The steps are tools we use over and over on our spiritual path. In the process of our recovery God will reveal more to us as we have the maturity and the spiritual strength to understand it. Over time, the nature of the work we have to do is disclosed to us. As we continue in recovery we begin to resolve some of the basic conflicts contributing to our addiction. As the pain of old wounds begins to fade, we begin to live more fully in the present. The fourth step allows us to identify the patterns, behaviors, and beliefs that show us the exact nature of our wrongs. We have written an inventory of ourselves which has revealed what we can change with God's help. To continue the process of change, we move on, making our admissions in Step 5. Step 5. 23. We admitted to God, to ourselves, add to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Now that we have completed our written inventory, it is essential that we share it promptly. The sooner we work our fifth step, the stronger the foundation of our recovery will be. We've built this foundation on spiritual principles such as surrender, honesty, trust, faith, willingness, and courage. With each step forward in our recovery we strengthen our commitment to these principles. We reaffirm our commitment to recovery by immediately working step 5. Despite our desire to recover, we may find that we're feeling frightened at this point. This fear is only natural. After all, we're about to confront the exact nature of our wrongs, candidly admitting our secrets to God, to ourselves, and to another human being. If we allow our feelings of shame or our fears of change and rejection to stop our progress, our problems will only be compounded. If we stop moving forward in our recovery, if we cease making every possible effort to recover, we will have given in to the disease of addiction. We must overcome our fear and work the fifth step if we are to make any significant changes in the way we live. We gather our courage and go on. We may call our sponsor for reassurance. Usually, a reminder that we don't have to face our feelings alone makes all the difference in easing our fears. Working this step with the support of our sponsor and a loving God is a way of putting into practice our decision to allow God to care for our will and our lives. That decision, like most decisions we make, must be followed with action. Following our third step decision with the action of the fourth and fifth steps will lead to a closer relationship with our higher power.
Our understanding of the spiritual principles we have practiced in the first four steps will be enhanced by working the fifth step. We experience honesty by making an admission, just as we did in step one, but we experience it on a deeper level. The admission we are about to make to ourselves in step five is especially important. Not only do we open up and tell the truth about ourselves, we also hear this admission from our own lips, breaking the pattern of denial that has plagued us for so long. We find new levels of honesty, especially self-honesty, when we squarely face the results of our addiction and see the reality of our lives. The risks we take in this step increase our trust in God and nourish the faith and hope we first experienced in step 2. We take our willingness a step further, thereby renewing the decision we made in step 3. We draw on the courage we acquired in step 4 and find that we are far more brave than we ever dreamed possible. This bravery is demonstrated not by our lack of fear but by the action we take in spite of our fear. We set a time to share our inventory then we show up and share at the scheduled time. Another action which requires courage is our admission to ourselves. We need to focus particular attention on this aspect of the fifth step. If we don't, we may find the benefits we derive from this step are not as meaningful as they could have been. As our basic text states, step 5 is not simply a reading of step 4. We want to make sure we are acknowledging and accepting the exact nature of our wrongs. We can even formalize this admission to ourselves if we think it will help. However, the manner in which we make this admission to ourselves is not as important as the action itself. We gain a new understanding of the principle of humility as we work this step. We've most likely been under the impression that we were somehow bigger or more visible than others. 24. People. Through working the fifth step, we find that few of our actions deserve exaggerated attention. Through our self-disclosure, we feel connected with humanity, perhaps for the first time in our lives. As we share our most personal feelings and our most carefully guarded secrets, we may experience anguish. However, Many of us have looked up and seen unconditional love in the eyes of the person hearing our fifth step. The feelings of acceptance and belonging we experienced at that moment helped us to feel a part of the program. The knowledge that we are about to face feelings we have long avoided may cause a rise in our anxiety level, but we go on, encouraged by our sponsor to trust the God of our understanding. The first thing we must realize is that the fifth step is not a quick fix for a painful situation. If we work this step expecting our feelings to go away, we are expecting the steps to numb as the way drugs did. We review our first four steps and see that their purpose is to awaken our spirits, not deaden our feelings. We will need support and understanding to cope with our feelings. If we choose an understanding individual to make our admissions to, we will have all the support we need. Although there is no requirement that the listener must be our sponsor, most of us choose to share our inventory with him or her. By doing so, we are most likely to benefit from the full range of experience another recovering addict has to share. After all, who can better understand what we are attempting than those who have done it for themselves? Addicts more experienced in recovery than year will already have dealt with the matters we are just beginning to face. Such people can share with us their experience and the solutions they have found through working this step.
The bond we share with our sponsor will strengthen our connection with the program and increase our sense of belonging. The person who listens to our fifth step should be someone who understands the process of recovery we are involved in and someone who is willing to help us through it. We have found that an ideal listener will have enough compassion to honor our feelings, enough integrity to respect our confidences, and enough insight to help us keep the exact nature of our wrongs within our field of vision. Knowing that we are sharing our inventory, she or he will help us to avoid getting sidetracked by blaming others for the things we've written about in our fourth step. Although we know we are going to derive meaningful benefits from working this step, we may still need to take a moment to reaffirm our surrender and the decision we made in the third step. We can ask a power greater than ourselves for the honesty, courage, and willingness to work this step. To invite God into this process, we may want to say a prayer. The prayer can be anything that reaffirms our commitment to recovery. Praying with the person hearing our fifth step can be a profoundly intimate experience. Not only do we pray to ask for strength and courage, many of us also ask our higher power to listen as we make our admission. Why is it so important that we also make our admission to God? Because this is a spiritual program, and our whole purpose is to awaken spiritually. Our willingness to approach our higher power openly with our past and who we are is central to our recovery. In the past, some of us felt that we weren't worthy of a relationship with God. Our secrets blocked our ability to feel any acceptance or love from that power. When we reveal something about ourselves, we draw closer to our higher power and experience the unconditional love and acceptance which springs from that power. The feeling that the God of our understanding accepts us, no matter what we've done, enhances our acceptance of ourselves. 25. The positive relationship we are building with a higher power carries over into our relationships with others as well. We may be surprised by the intensity of the partnership we are developing with our sponsor as we share our inventory. If we've never really been listened to before, we may be startled to discover that we are being asked questions about some fine point of our personal history or that our sponsor is jotting down notes while we share. Our self-esteem increases as we realize that what we have to share is worth such close attention. We may see deep compassion in our listeners' eyes, showing us that our pain is understood. That compassion is one more assurance of the presence of a power greater than ourselves. Looking at and sharing the exact nature of our wrongs is not likely to be a comfortable activity. We have looked back and seen how representative eating the same patterns over and over again has kept us stuck in the same place. And we haven't just seen the surface behavior, we've seen the defects of character that have been behind our behavior all along. We start to realize that there is a difference between our act ions and the exact nature of our wrongs. For instance, we may see example after example of situations where we lied in a vain attempt to make everyone like us. But those examples aren't the nature of our wrongs. The nature of these wrongs is the dishonesty and manipulation we were demonstrating each time we lied. If we look beyond the dishonesty and manipulation, we'll most likely find that we were afraid no one would like us if we told the truth. As we share our inventory our sponsor will sometimes share some of his or her own experience with us. 
Our sponsor may try with us or smile in recognition at some of the struggles we are now sharing. We may laugh together as we share some of the more comical aspects of our addiction and the ridiculous lies we told ourselves so that we could continue to live as we were living. As we see how similar our feelings are to our sponsor's feelings, we realize that there are other people like us. We're human beings, nothing more, nothing less. Our self-obsession blinded us to this, making us feel unique. Suddenly we understand that other people, too, have painful problems and that ours are no more significant than anyone else's. Healing can take place when we see a glimpse of ourselves in the eyes of another. We find humility in that moment and a reason to hope that the serenity and peace we have been striving for are within our reach at last. Our feelings of alienation fade as we experience an emotional connection with another human being. We are allowing someone entry to those places we've never before opened to another person. This may be the first time we've ever trusted another person enough to tell her or him about ourselves and allow that person to get to know us. We may be surprised at the closeness that develops between us and our sponsor. We're developing a give-and-take relationship based on equality and mutual respect, the kind that can last for a lifetime. After working our fifth step, we may feel a little raw or emotionally vulnerable. We've taken a major step in the healing process of recovery. This process could be thought of as surgery of the spirit. We've opened up old wounds. We've exposed our most carefully constructed lies for the deceptions they were, and we've told ourselves some painful truths. We've dropped our masks in the presence of another person. At this point, we may experience a dangerous urge to run from our new awareness and return to the familiar misery of the past. We may feel tempted to avoid our sponsor because he or she knows all about us now. It is very important that we resist such impulses. We must talk with other recovering addicts about our fears and feelings so we can hear the experience they have too. 26. Share. You'll find that what we're going through is not unique and feel relieved when others tell us they went through the very same struggles after they worked with this step. Our awareness of our patterns of relating with others and the risks we have just taken in admitting them to another bring about a momentous breakthrough in our relationships. Not only do we form a close bond with our sponsor, but the risk we take in trusting this person will help us develop close relationships with others as well. We've risked trusting one person with our secrets and our feelings, and we haven't been rejected. We begin to have the freedom to trust others. Not only do we find out that others are trustworthy and deserve our friendship, we find that we are also trustworthy and deserving. We may have thought we were incapable of loving or being loved or ever having friends. We discover that these beliefs were unfounded. We learn, from the example of our sponsor, how to be a more caring friend. Our relationships begin to change after this step, including the one we have with the God of our understanding. Throughout the process of the fifth step, we turn to that power when we were fearful, and we received the courage we needed to complete the step. Our belief in our faith grew as a result. Because of this, we're willing to put more of ourselves into building a relationship with God. Just like any other relationship, the one we develop with our higher power calls for openness and trust on our part. 
When we share our most personal thoughts and feelings with our higher power, letting down our walls and admitting we are less than perfect, intimacy develops. We develop a certainty that our higher power is always with us and that we are being cared for. The process we have undertaken so far has made us aware of the exact nature of our wrongs. The exact nature of those wrongs is our character defects. We now know that the patterns of our lives were rooted in dishonesty, fear, selfishness, and many other defects of character. We've seen the whole spectrum of our defects and are ready for something new. With this readiness, we move on to Step 6. Step 6. 27. We were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. The insight we gained in Step 5 regarding the exact nature of our wrongs, while valuable, is only the beginning of the striking changes that take place in our lives as we move on to Step 6. The admission we made of the nature of our wrongs, our character defects, is necessary if we are to be ready to have them removed. Weakly shaken by our part in the past, we can expect our attitudes to be profoundly changed by working the sixth step. Although some of us have not understood the critical importance of the sixth and seventh steps, they are essential actions that must be taken if we expect to make any significant and lasting changes in our lives. We cannot simply say, yes, I'm ready. God, please remove my defects, and go on to step 8. If we gloss over the 6th and 7th steps and go on to make our amends, we will only wind up owing more amends by repeating the same destructive patterns as before. The lifelong process of the 6th step is just that a process. We've started the process of becoming entirely ready, and we will strive to increase our readiness throughout our lifetime. Our job is to become entirely ready and to open our hearts and minds to the deep internal changes that can only be brought about by the presence of a loving God. We've already had experience in the third step with what we must do now in the sixth step. Just as we surrendered our will and lived to the care of a power greater than ourselves because we could no longer go on managing our own lives, we now prepare to surrender our defects of character to a loving God because we have exhausted our attempts to change on our own willpower. This process is difficult and often painful. Our growing awareness of our defects often causes us pain. We've all heard the expression, ignorance is bliss, but we are no longer ignorant of our character defects, and this awareness hurts. All of a sudden, we'll notice a wounded look in the eyes of a friend after we've acted on one of our less endearing traits. We'll hang our heads in shame, mumble an apology and probably beat ourselves inwardly for being so callous one more time. We feel sick inside, knowing how our actions adversely affect the people in our lives. We are sick and tired of being the people we have been, but this feeling compels us to change and grow. We want to be different than we have been in the past, and the good news is that we already are. Being able to see beyond our own interests and being concerned about the feelings of others are striking changes, considering that our raging self-obsession is at the core of our disease. We are likely to feel very frustrated as we notice that our defects are getting in the way of our recovery. We may attempt to suppress them ourselves by either denying their existence or hiding them from others. We may think that if no one knows about them, our more unattractive characteristics will go away. What we must do, 
Rather than try to exert power and control over our defects, it's step out of the way and allow a loving God to work in our lives. One part of this process involves becoming responsible for our behavior.